it's spoiler in time. If I were Tom Merritt, I would say right now that today we are going to spoil The Shield, episode two of season six, Game of Thrones, episode nine of the current season, Sense8, episodes one through three, read some feedback about Mr. Robot, and then I would introduce Brian Brushwood. Well, hypothetically, were I Brian Brushwood, I would say, thank you, Tom. I'm really excited to do more spoiler in time and to introduce our letter answering segment called Triage. Let's for the do first that time. right after we talk about the movie draft. Oh, but I would say that. Movie draft. Uh, it's all over, uh. folks. Uh, well, Am Trekker's the winner. No doubts. It's going to happen. Uh, everybody has one movie, and so that's the, that's it. That's the end. <laughs> it's not true, though. So not true. Uh, Age of Ultron barely got Am Trekker into first place, and uh, Team Am Trekker now on their second movie, uh, Insidious Chapter second. 3, and third. and third movie, Spy. So this is it. They, uh, they Their one movie was Ultron, uh, Age of Ultron. Their other two movies combined equal 45,000 or 40 no yeah well here's the question 50, no one, one in hollywood is asking brian what are insidious chapter three and spy gonna make next week uh nothing they're gonna make 20 dollars <laughs> and or a taco but not both that is that is all let's they be will generous get. let's be generous and say insidious chapter three ends up with like 35 million and spy ends up with 60 million it, right. it doesn't and matter. That's doesn't matter. Generous, I mean, right? I mean that, that. So, so what you're saying is, if we're insanely generous, we could say Amtrak is going to clock in at maybe six hundred million dollars for the summer. Which I'll tell you, if that's the case, there's a good chance GFQ is going to usurp them and take number one. But uh, meanwhile, you know, we talked about Tomorrowland coming out, Hot Pursuits out, Aloha came out. Uh, I guess Team Night Attack. We've got uh, Inside Out coming out around the corner. Yeah, a couple weeks. Well, actually, yeah, this week's is, is Team Cord Killers, right? They're in the basement right now, but that is mostly because they only had one movie, The Longest Ride, second week of the season. Uh, so this is their first big bet, Jurassic World. And when we say Team Cord Killers, just to prevent the confusion, we're talking about Christy Cates and Milango. They represented for Cord Killers because Brian was on Night Attack and I was on Team DTNS. That is correct. And I'll tell you what, I would not knock them out just yet. Um, there's a, If you remember last year, around this time, nobody really expected a lot from Guardians of the Galaxy, Chris Pratt vehicle, that ended up blowing our minds, became the number one biggest box office draw all the way up until the end of the year when American Sniper took it over. So I'm going to say anything's possible here, man. I, I, I honestly can't call this one at all, though my gut says, you know, if I was going to gamble, it would definitely be on Team DTNS just for all the late stage bargains you got. But even then, I'm not going to say that's 100%. I'm seeing billboards for Ted, too, and I'm liking it. Yeah, I'll bet. Say about that. <laughs> I'll bet you do. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think Jurassic World will lift Team Cord Killers into at least fourth place, probably a solid fourth place next week. It's all going to be like, where does it go after that? That 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 is This is their definitive movie. You're absolutely right. Agreed. Shall we move on to triage? Yes, triage, uh, where we get some feedback about things we have previously spoiled. Uh, hence, the triage. Like, 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 yeah, no, and, and for the record, like by spoil, I mean like this. This is talking about material that's ruined, ruined and spoiled, and and might as well you just write it off. That's why it's triage, and yeah. that's why we're sharing uh, it. Right so here. we're black tagging this email from BioCal. Uh, finally, got around to watching Mr. Robot today. I didn't get 15 minutes into it before I had to stop and tweet you both about how much his monologue up to that point, especially the one talking about him hacking his therapist and having a funny feeling about her boyfriend, reminded me of Dexter. After watching the rest of the episode, there were many more aspects of Elliot that reminded me of Dexter. They share the following similar attributes. Both are closed off from the world and unsure how to communicate with normal people because they feel different. They break the law in order to right wrongs. Their nine to five job is to catch the exact type of person their alter ego is. They do their homework before taking action. When under stress, they partake in their illegal hobby to relieve pressure. And they both keep trophies of their victims hidden away somewhere in their apartments. Pretty good. Pretty good uh, comparison. He says Elliot even has an Asian coworker with a dirty mouth. And this might be a stretch, but he seems to want to protect his coworker slash friend Angela, much like Dexter looked out for his sister. Uh, then there's the whole similarity of Fight Club. But he's saying it's Mr. Robot is Dexter meets Fight Club. 
Uh, well, uh, yeah, dude. Uh, I, I, if that's the case, that's the best sales pitch I've ever heard. Hopefully, it'll end better than Dexter did. I can't believe I didn't see these parallels to Dexter because when he tweeted that, I was like, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that. There is a little bit of Dexter, especially in his internal monologue and you know how he plans. And then he laid this all out. I'm like, yeah. Oh my gosh, it's almost point for point, like a rip, not a rip off, but like this is the Dexter of hacking. Yeah. No, definitely playing from the same playbook. Uh, shall we move into our first thing to spoil? Our first thing to spoil is Sense8, the J. Michael Straczynski Wachowski's vehicle uh, joint. I don't know how you call it. I call it good. Uh, in fact, I watched the first four episodes. Brian got through three and part of the fourth. So we're just going to spoil the first three for now. And really, honestly, the third one is where all the spoiling takes place. Yeah. Right? Okay. So so uh, jumping forward, uh, I, I will say let's, uh, uh, let's start with the negatives first uh, because – uh, man, oh man, that first episode was hitting you over the head like, do you get it? These are people from very different backgrounds who all have a different story. So that bothered you. That didn't bother me at all. Well, it's just, it's fine to say that, but then but then something should happen. But but like nothing happens the first four episodes. It's nothing but, uh, but unaffiliated vignettes and you have to take it on faith that this is going to go somewhere. And at some point... You know, the fifth time they go back, and the problem is, is eight characters is an awful lot to get me to care about all at once in the first episode. You don't give enough time to any one character. It all shows up as a collage. And in fact, you know, I think things got better in the second episode where it clearly became the story of one or two of the major characters. By second episode, it becomes uh, about, um, uh, oh, what was what was her name? Um Riley? Nomi, Nomi. Oh, no. uh, uh, you know, it, it becomes about Nomi, and and you see her plight and her situation, and 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 it becomes engaging. And then, uh, uh, and just as you're lulled into that, you jump to a very different situation with uh with a kung fu uh, corporate girl. Um, see, and this is just it. We're in the early days where I'm never going to learn anyone's names, but uh, unless there's a major plot point about it, um. I, it took it took a long time, and it, by the end of episode two, I was thinking like, ah, oh, crap, is this another Marco Polo? Is oh, this... you mean Sun Bach, daughter of a powerful soul businessman and burgeoning star in the underground kickboxing world? Cheater. I totally said off the top of my head, not looking at the Wikipedia. Article. Cheater, no prosthetic brains, sir. Uh, the uh, yeah, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's like around the end of episode two, I was really worried that it was going to be another Marco Polo, but things really seemed to happen in episode three. Uh, that moment where everything came together and by the way how great is the ridiculousness of the ripped off intellectual properties being used in what i assume is you know, is, you know nairobi or, or wherever uh or or uh, oh, oh the the buses yeah uh, yeah the, the bat, bat van the van dam the, the bat van versus van oh, dam van, right? yeah and then the van dam and it's like how petty and 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 yet it's yet simultaneously their their squabble is hilariously petty and small but also they make it very clear that this is their world to them you know it's like they uh, it, it's, it's not a game and it's, um, I don't know. I, I love the way it all came together with him borrowing the shooting skills of, uh, of the cop, borrowing the fighting skills of, uh, Sun Bok. Uh, and I, I, I'm really curious if he'll pull it off. Unfortunately, the chatter I'm seeing on Twitter from some of our fellow fans in Diamond Club indicates that it doesn't really pay off, but I, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to keep going. Mixed, I'm seeing mixed views. I'm seeing people saying it just keeps getting better until the end blew my mind. And I'm seeing people saying, wow, it just didn't end up going anywhere. I it don't understand, which that to me alone is intriguing. Like how can those people have watched the same thing and come to such different conclusions? And it's because of the complexity of the story, because it, it's interesting to me that we both have the same evaluation of the first episode, which is real slow, not convinced. That's how I, after the first episode, I'm like, well, that was that was maybe better than I expected, but not, I'm still not sure. I'm still not convinced that this is going anywhere. But it wasn't because of the stories. I'm like, these are all really interesting stories. I'm really intrigued by these characters. Uh, it's not what I signed up for. Uh, I did not sign up for Night on Earth uh, times two. Uh, with eight characters. I'm like, is this just going to be a, a drama about eight different lives who are slightly intertwined and sen the sense eight thing is just kind of laid on top of it can, as a, as a reason. That's what I was worried about. Of course, can, by, can I, by can episode I? three, they have disproved that to you. And they're like, Oh no, 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 no. They're, these are one mind. And of course, Naveen Andrews, 
character, uh, Jonas, also helps drive that home when he shows up uh, and talks to the guy from Stargate Universe. Uh, what's his name? Uh, he's the captain in Chicago or the uh, the officer uh, in Chicago. But uh, Will, Will Gorski. Uh, this, it, it shows like, okay, we are going to intertwine these characters and they're going to have to deal with all kinds of odd stuff. But I, I really do like these individual character stories. After you got three episodes in, did you like the character stories better? Oh, I, you know, I suspect it's going to be a lot like watching The Leftovers. The Leftovers felt like a lot of homework until we got to the point where all of the characters in the small town felt like real people to me. And once that happened, you know, really amazing stuff happens. You, you know, once once the um, uh, 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 the guilty remnant or whatever, once I kind of understood why they're hated and what their what their angle is, you know, it made a big difference uh, going forward. And I suspect the same thing's going to happen here. Um, I, I got to tell you, uh, Nomi's story is fascinating. Uh, you know, of course, knowing the the uh, uh, what you know what's public public about the 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 transition for one of the Wachowski uh, siblings, I, I got to feel a lot of what's happening in Nomi's story has, if not you know, the facts of of um, you know her life. Uh, at least the flavor of it, you know, she, she went I through I don't think she was imprisoned on the top floor. Oh, no, 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 no. And, and of, of course I'm not talking about that, but, but you know, that's, that is, that is a uh, situation that I have no frame of reference for what that must be like. So as a result, when a story like this comes along, it's a fascinating, um, uh, well, what frame of moment. reference do you have for any of these characters? I mean, uh, uh, Russians living in Berlin stealing diamonds is not something I have much of a frame of reference for. Oh, either. No, no, I no. guess you have a lock picking connection. Well, there. no, 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 but, but like that, that I can draw. That's easy. I could draw an analog of like, a, you know, oh man, that's like doing a gig and trying to get, you know, pull pull a gig out from someone else and getting there in time and being there first or whatever. Same and you've thing been with an like under, uh, underground kickboxer. So uh, that, well, you know, obviously that one less so, but, but, uh, but I did, yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think I mean, the brilliance of this is that, you know, if anything, I'm disappointed that there are two U.S. characters instead of just one, uh, because I love the fact that we are spread out with such differing characters, including a telenovela actor uh, in Mexico City. Well, and, and which, this is... This is very much one of the things I dug was was uh, they're trying to reach across spectrums for everything. So it's like, you know, in, in you know, obviously you have a lot of straight characters. You have someone who's 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 a trans woman who's in a relationship with another woman in a, in a very accepting community at the most accepting time of the year. It's pride and, and it's all that. Uh, and then uh, but then separately, you have uh, what what in some ways is the same and yet polar opposite. You have somebody who's in a a, a, a healthy homosexual relationship ship but but has to be closeted for business reasons his entire you know it, you know Me mexico is, is is not as accepting a community especially in the tabloids and uh, you know in the press for all this uh, i i thought that juxtaposition was fascinating and what i look forward to is seeing other uh, other other polarities uh, represented. Um, I, I mean, unfortunately, I wish there was a really ugly person or a really, you know, a, a, a really unhealthy, overweight person or something. I don't know. Just just it would be great if we could see even more polarities that weren't. Mm, I, I I would like to see more spaces explored with this concept. Uh, yeah, they they. I mean, you're kind of. You're saying, wow, you went this far. Why didn't you go farther? Which is an easy criticism to make. Correct. Correct. Uh, so and, I, and I don't I want understand to take away why anything. Maybe they said that this is as far as we want to stretch because we want to stretch really far in a couple of these stories. But I agree with you. Like, I wouldn't have minded at all if they had stretched even farther. But it, this is this is a this is a pretty good mix here. And and my favorite stories are Lido's. Because you think, and this is one thing that they're doing well with the with the sideline stories. You think it's going one way, and it doesn't. Like when you first meet Nomi, I hadn't read up, so I didn't know anything about her character. I was surprised to find out that that she was trans. Of course, like you said, you're like, oh, we got some life experience on the writing team here, so that that makes sense that they would want to try to tell a story there. But then what, she's a hacktivist, and and she's not what you think, and. Leto was exactly that. That hilarious moment where he lets the actor woman who he has been kind of using as his beard without her yeah. knowledge in 
And she comes upstairs and 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 did made it's the big discovery that he was trying to hide. And he's laughing, and there and you're oh she's gonna freak out. And she's like, "This is great." Well, well and plus also and this becomes a third roommate. I, 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 I well, and plus like like against the will of of Leto, like Leto's not cool with it. Except but, Leto's boyfriend's like, "Yeah, sure, fine." Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I love, I I adore this. And to be honest, this is one of those things like your worry in episode two, like, oh, is this just separate stories overlaid with a little bit of supernatural? I got to be honest, like. At this point, I'm just enough seduced by the characters and the situations that even if that's all this ever is, I, I'm kind of okay with it. All of the stories have been good. The vignettes have been good. You know, the story of somebody who's who's trying to, you know, uh, transition uh, or or successfully transitioned from from man to woman, but the but the family doesn't uh, doesn't agree with it and held against her will and so on. And uh, you know, even you know the the Nairobi cat bus driver and all this stuff. Uh, you know, there at this point there are a number of stories that I feel like are underdeveloped, but I feel like there's only more good, rich character development waiting underneath. I think, I think the more I talk to you about this, the more I realize that there's a lot to love in here. Yeah. And the, well, and there's, there's a lot of unrealized potential. You're absolutely right. And we see the, the very beginning of what they can do with this when our, 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 uh, our, our Kenyan, uh, bus, bus driver, uh, and, I'm going to find his name here. Uh, people, people are uh, calling him. What's his name? Uh, Kafis Van Dam. Oh, he actually changed his name to Van Dam. That's I don't amazing. Know if he changed it, or if it just happened to be Van Dam. <laughs> but uh, he he is is like bravely going to get those drugs back for his mom. Good, total compelling story right there as well, right? And and yet, and you're like, oh, I know what's going to happen because she's doing the kickboxing. So yeah. he's going to be able to tap into that. And he's in the firing range. So he's going to be able to tap into that. In fact, if anything, I thought they blew the firing range a little bit. I'm like, oh, all he did was shoot the car. I wanted to see him do some marksman stuff, but whatever. Like it all came together. It was kick ass. It was great. And then on top of that, that is when it struck me like that's not the only connection here. You have the drugs and the false drugs. And you have the woman who is the pharmacist in Mumbai, uh, Kala, who was in a lecture talking about being able to identify false drugs. You have hospital scenes with people talking about drugs. You have a pharmacist. Uh, there's another pharmacy related uh, thing in the Germans story as well. Um uh, there yeah, I, don't, some kind I don't of remember what it was funding yeah. or something there. But so there's a there's a whole subplot just being draped around in the back revolve re, uh, around pharmacy. And of course, yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right that Nomi's story being uh, kind of a, a normal story for that kind of person being blown up large, which is the doctor's you know, are trying to fix you against your will and the family is undermining you. And it's, it's just a nightmare story. And I love that Martha Jones gets to save her. Yeah, I, I, I dug um, just a quick shout out to how beautiful it all is. Um, I mean, it's very well shot. It feels big. Um, again, at three episodes in, I'm not sure where this is headed and I don't know if they'll stick the landing, but I do know that I'm more committed at this point than I was on the leftovers, uh, episode three. Yeah, me too. Uh, I will say also quick shout out for that little vignette of, uh, of the Icelandic DJ walking in the subway tunnel and just giving all that money to that random ass, uh, blind, uh, piano player on the street. Um, I feel like we haven't seen the end of that. They, mm. they focused a little too much on her putting that money in there. I, uh, something's going to come back out of that. That's, that's a, that's a Chekhov's gun. Uh, no, yeah, I, I'd, I'd hate to admit it, but I think you're right. And I didn't expect that. And I don't know. I, I, I think, yeah. Uh, okay. But I, I also agree that it was awesome. What did you, I, the four non blonde song, uh, I'm actually glad that they had Freema Ajaman's character say that that obviously was uh, a, a symptom of of something bad happening, that she had that song stuck in her head. But I also loved the idea of all of, all of them singing it together. That was pretty cool. Wait, uh, maybe maybe I tuned out. Oh, uh, is that maybe episode four? I may have just spoiled something. Yeah, for no, that that's that's fine. So there, there's a moment of synchronicity coming up where they all experience the same thing. Yeah, at the same time. yeah. Okay. And, that's the other thing is I maybe this is good that they're doing it, but every episode I get to a point where I'm like, uh, I need to see some sense of stuff happen now. And about that time, it usually does. So yeah. Maybe it's working, but I, I kind of want to see more of that. I want to see that. I want to see me asking that question less. I want I want to see them start to really use their hive mind powers together. And by the way, uh, Naveen Andrews as uh, as the mysterious stranger so far is killing it. Every time I've seen him in there, it's like um, 
you know, it, uh, he, 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 he that's a, that's I, I don't know if that's a super easy role to play or if it's hard because there's expectations of it but it's like you know I don't know I, I feel like he brings just the right flavor and and that constant question of like is he real is he not real what parts of this is real what parts are hallucination and I like the fact that in the second episode they make it clear like uh, yeah brain parts fusing equals hallucinations equals you just like Mr. Robot you have built in an unreliable narrator, which I think uh, I think matters a lot. Or do you? I mean, that and that's the best part is it, do we do, are her brain parts freezing? Or yeah. is that just a BS story provided by this doctor who's part of the pharmacist conspiracy and a member of Terrence Mann's group that's trying to hunt down the sensates and kill him? Yeah. Uh, for the record, uh, real quick opening scene with Daryl Hannah, uh, uh, Guchum points out was was trippy. It was also great. And in fact, uh, I had forgotten that Daryl Hannah was in this. I just remember thinking like, wow, man, that chick is really committing to it. Like, I feel her pain and, and, and her torture. And I understand why she's about to kill herself, even though I don't know what's going on. And then I was like, oh, wait, it's Dara Hannah uh, or Daryl Hannah, a, a super talented actress. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the game of the thrones. Holy cow. Uh, and I thought, oh, okay, so episode eight was huge. Uh, we'll just kind of take a breath for episode nine. It'll be fun and frolicking in Westeros. And we got the opposite. Ooh, boy. Uh, hey, uh, lots of good, lots of bad. Let's start with the bad, shall we? Uh, what is up with Stannis Baratheon uh, so close to Father's Day doing this to his daughter? Uh, why, and why does he have to do it literally the day after I took my daughter for a trip up to a friend's lake house and oh, uh, spent the whole day with her? <laughs> That's just, horrible. Just daddy-daughter time and then come yeah. back and, and watch that. Um, and apparently not in the books, obviously. We're past the books with the Stannis story as far as we know. Uh, but they implied in the post show that this is something that will be in the books. Uh, oh, I don't know. How, how, how do they imply that? I, I Benny Off and Weiss said, when George R. R. Martin told us that this happened to Shireen, we were like, blah, 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 blah. So, okay. So, so, so it's, it's from, from this from is going to happen. Sources familiar with the matter, i.e., yeah. the people writing the show, say this will happen in the book. Um, man, that was rough and it was so brilliant. What, what was great about it was the little bit of foreshadowing. Uh, I, I don't usually watch the previously on stuff, but HBO now shows that automatically. So you can always kind of read into where the story's headed based on what they remind you happened in the past. And when they did all this, you know, uh, showing of the, the, the leeches burning and King's blood value or whatever, uh, it colored everything from that point forward and every interaction that little the little dance of words that uh, that the Onion Knight has with Stan, Stannis uh, or Sir Davos, um, it just felt heavy and pregnant and terrifying. And you could see if you read between the lines that he was begging, begging him to not kill his daughter. And Stannis with his uh, uh, stoicism did it. Uh, and, and it was made all the more painful by this clear indication when when Sir Davos gives her the staggy cut uh and and kisses her you know warmly like he is the two of them have such a precious and unusual relationship in that he was the student to her to learn how to read he was the, his most vulnerable he laid all of his pretense of being an adult in control of his fate down and learned from a, a little girl uh and she in return you know clearly found him found in him the warm uh loving emotional aspects that that she wasn't able to get from uh Stannis and uh and it makes the betrayal all the more painful that just two or three episodes we we're all high-fiving about how Stannis actually showed genuine affection for his daughter which which again only makes the you know the sacrifice of her all the more powerful because i don't think he was faking when he was saying like i'll kill any man who keeps me from you know uh, uh letting my daughter live and when he is that man you know it turns out stannis is the one that knocks i mean yeah uh stannis will kill any man except himself <laughs> that does that uh yeah and he stops his wife. His wife's all in on it until the daughter starts screaming. And then the wife buckles, uh, showing finally some sense of humanity. Uh, and even then, he's like, no, uh, we're not stopping this. And can, can, uh, can, can cold, I say real quick? blooded to, for a fired god. 
to tie it back to a previous discussion, you were saying that you felt like the rape was uh, of, of Sansa on our wedding night was gratuitous and too much and it kind of left you out or whatever. Um, I kind of I, I hinted that I trust that it's for a larger purpose. Um, and I, I think I'm going to double down on that for the reason that they didn't show they didn't go for any cheap shot showing a burning child to us. They could have done that and it would have been the talk of the thing, but they didn't. They showed the reactions. They showed the people uncomfortable and a bit terrified of their leader. Um, like because they can show restraint in that kind of situation again, suggests to me that there was a reason that they did it with Sansa. We'll find that out in the future. My Especially opinion on that is, that is not changed at all. It was unnecessary. We already have everything we need to know. Uh, and you wouldn't have had to show that much of the scene to know that Sansa is eroding away under Ramsay and that she wants him dead. I, it just seemed unnecessary. This scene as horrible and worse uh, in, in many ways uh, was necessary because you've been led to believe the opposite, that Stannis loves his daughter and wouldn't let any harm come to her. Uh, I, I think you could argue that they could have stopped the screaming uh, a little earlier, but all, all in all, uh, you, you needed to see Stannis do this so that you know that, okay, Stannis is not a good man uh, anymore. Uh, if this is what he would do for power, he does not deserve it. Uh, and that the Red Lady is not worth following. Uh, well, and, and you, it changes your opinions about people. Whereas I didn't change my opinion of Ramsey after that. And I, I don't really want to debate it. We just have two different takes on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I, 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 th I think that's a really good point, though. Um, uh, and what's interesting is I never, I never thought that Stannis was a good man, but I did at times become convinced he was an honorable man. Right. And Especially that, and Castle that's Black, that's right? over now, right? Yeah. You know, it's like um, uh, he is not a promise keeper. <laughs> <laughs> and that no. he made a very explicit promise to his daughter that no one would would uh, that she would not come to harm. Uh, man, that was really hard. And it's amazing. Here's what's amazing is we started off talking about the most powerful scene in the movie. And it was the number one, a scene that was not shown. And it was not a scene that involved a dwarf. A dragon, uh, a badass, an unsullied, uh, and 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 a, and a mother of dragons fighting an entire arena of dudes in masks. How amazing uh, yeah, is this, that? This had me pumping my fist. It had Eileen and I both up off the couch cheering. <laughs> yes. Uh, once uh, Daenerys mounted the dragon, and frankly, she does mount a dragon and fly out of a fighting pit in the book. However. The circumstances Very are entirely different, and I would argue that the circumstances in the TV show are much more fun. Better, this is better, a much better setup. Better, better. Here, show this. Show this right there. Uh, well, what I'm seeing on the screen here. Bye, haters. She hops onto a dragon <laughs> and flies the hell away. <laughs> uh, I mean, and it was so well choreographed because they're surrounded, and Eileen, who's never read the books, by the way, says, "Oh, so Drogon's gonna come." Uh, because they're surrounded and, and it, it's, it's, so she, you know, it's, it's obvious like, okay, the only way they get out of this is Drogon, but they lead us on with, you know, like some, some killing of harpies, uh, the sons of harpies going down and looking like, well, maybe they could fight their way out of this. Like this is, this is crazy. And then of course, no, uh, Drogon comes and then it looks like maybe they're going to have Drogon get staked. He gets a couple of, uh, staffs in his neck. He's, he's not looking like, uh, he's doing very well there for a second. Uh, the one thing is they did, she did leave Jorah and Tyrion, uh, and, uh, um, uh, what's his name? Well, the, well, well uh, yeah, they, but but they did so under circumstances Cereal. where where clearly uh, Dario, 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 uh, uh, they they had clearly weakened. You know, uh, Drogon took out enough of the bad guys that in our minds it's plausible that they made it out alive, right? Uh, they they even the odds because at, at first it was definitely overwhelming. Um, quick uh, quick book talk. Uh, skip the next thirty seconds. Um, I, I suspect this is speculation on my part, uh, but in, in the book she flies off, uh, and in that moment she's best friends with Drogon or whatever. And then uh, in, in the books, there's a lot of you know continuing to win the respect of Drogon consistently. Uh, I, I suspect they're going to skip all that in the in the television show. Do you think, or did you get the impression from watching this that like, oh, now she's the queen that they need and Drogon well, I, respects I, it's her? It's a useless question to me. Uh, yeah. She left under entirely different circumstances. And the stuff that happens in the book is really just setting you up for a cliffhanger at the end of the book. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna be past that 
by the beginning of next season anyway. Yeah. Uh, whether we see her and Drogon spend a lot of time together or not, I think we will see them spend time together, though. I yeah. think we will see her, you know, see where she goes. She, where she'll, she she'll spend some time in the wild. There'll be some personal growth time. She'll hopefully hey, come back yeah. uh, like the Phoenix as a reborn and uh, stronger leader that uh, has the respect of dragons as well as their, uh, uh, I don't know, their mothership. Yeah. Uh, uh, and frankly, I, you know, Arya story kind of treads water a little bit. Uh, oh, it's dude. just a matter of whether Jacqueline, uh believes her or not about what actually went down. Dude, are you kidding me? The moment like like uh like when 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 that envoy showed up and she bails on her mission, Bonnie looked over to me and I was and, and like not understanding why this Tyrell merited her attention. And I'm like, no, it's not it's not him. It's like it's Sir Marin. And 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 the moment I said He's on the list. He's in the prayer. And then uh, Bonnie was like, oh, you know, it's like, you know, that 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 mounting tension. To be honest, I'm glad that they're letting us simmer on this a little bit. Like, yeah, yeah. She knows she has another assassination to complete, but there's you one have, that supersedes it. You have to tell it. this part of the story. And with so much else going on, I, I don't begrudge it either. Uh, Jamie's story uh, was funny. It was the comedic relief, I guess. Uh, yeah, it was it was a lighter tale, and to be yeah. honest, I think we needed that. There was a lot of dark stuff. I I didn't mind it at all. Uh, uh, to be honest, yeah, I don't uh, mind any of these. I I busted out laughing with the two sisters playing slaps game, and then it's like, oh, finally it's my turn, <laughs> and just whack across the face. That was a great surprise. It was a great moment. Uh, and and then Jon Snow's story. Uh, uh, you know, again, we just had hard home, right? Uh, they could have just had John uh, walk up, knock on the gate, and walk in. I would have been fine. You get a little dramatic tension, like, well, are they going to let him back in or not? Uh, we're, obviously, this is just setting us up for the next stage of that story as well. Yeah, well, and and plus also, I, I forget the name of the guy who was, you know, the previous uh, 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 president elect of the <laughs> of the of the wall. But uh, but that moment where he does again the honorable thing, where it's like he disagrees vehemently with Jon Snow's decision but opens up the gate and lets that the wild young kid in. is going to do something bad though I uh you know who knows uh we'll 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 see I'm excited we only got one episode left next week is the season finale Mother's Mercy could not be more excited uh this was season five correct so we have two uh, seasons I just closed left. that tab but I think you're right yeah season five <laughs> episode nine if I remember correctly um uh, whatever um, but, uh, uh, dude, I'm kind of with the, I forget who it was yeah, at HBO. Five. I forget who it was at HBO saying like, I don't know. I personally would like another season of game of Thrones. How about it was you guys? The, it was the VP of programming at HBO, right? Yeah. I kind of agree with him. I kind of would love three more. Or, seasons. We have two more coming. I you know, want three, uh, what, three, four. We can take our time. We don't need to rush. We're, I'm I good. don't I'm good. want them to be doing shows when they shouldn't. So on that issue i trust benioff and weiss if benioff and weiss say nope you may say you want another season but if we did it you'd be complaining i'm gonna trust them yeah all right fair enough let's get to a uh, show that we know only has seven seasons and we're in season six episode two the shield tom episode two baptism by fire hold on in which tom realizes that from this point on it feels like Every episode is a season finale. <laughs> yes. Okay. Look, uh, here's the thing. When I was pitching, you know, when Jeff Kanata says it's the best show on television, when Bry Brushwood says, seriously, let's make it a project, do it. We are, we are aware there's a bunch of seasons, but the feeling that we have is the feeling of every episode starting from uh, two episodes back and forward. I am so enjoying rewatching these, jumping in just for the for the white hot electricity of everything that happens in this one. This is the episode where we see Kavanaugh resign We're on the chessboard. I mean, um, in a good chess match, and we talked about this. You threaten a piece, but then you also protect another piece. They counter threaten. You have a backup plan, and everything is so intricate where it's like a knot, and one thing feels like everything can cascade down at any moment. And in that game, Kavanaugh just tilted his king and set it down and gave this beatific smile where it's like, yeah, man, I'm going to go to jail for a little bit. I ruined my whole life because I tried to play your game, which only makes me more certain that you're a monster and monsters are going to get what they deserve. And I'm not worried about it. Well, and, and that's the brilliance of the Kavanaugh character is last week you're thinking, 
oh, Kavanaugh is descending into Mackey territory. And this week you were like, no, Kavanaugh really was a better man. Uh, and when it, when it got to the point where he realized the water was streaming in, he didn't try to plug the dike. He swam. Uh, he's like, he's like, yeah, I, I give up. Uh, please get me out of this pool. I don't know. My metaphor is breaking down. But he, he wouldn't, like you said, would not play Mackey's game. Uh, and Mackey overplayed his game in this episode. Yeah. Uh, by, and this, this is what the shield does, right? Through miscommunication or bad timing, uh, characters miss their opportunities for redemption quite often. And it absolutely happens to Vic. Uh, Vic goes back to Farmington and sits tight. He's clean. He's clear at the end of this episode. He has almost zero loose ends uh, to tie up. Uh, but because he spent so much time trying to protect himself from what he thought Kavanaugh was going to do, he now has several loose ends that can come back to bite him. Yeah, it's uh, everything starts to uh, the center doesn't hold and things mm -hmm. spend out of control. Right. Uh, uh, best best scene of this episode, though, is uh, ex Ms. Mackey. Uh, in the middle of the Farmington of the barn, oh my uh, God. shouting about what Kavanaugh did. I was I was la I was gasping. I was laughing. I was cheering. And Eileen was looking at me because I'm I actually watch these on my phone. Oh these really? Days. Right on. Yeah. By the way, uh, and and she's like, what? What are you looking? At? She's thinking I'm looking at some funny YouTube video. I was like, I'm watching The Shield. She's like, oh okay, yeah. And it's gonna take <laughs> way too long for you to explain this to me. So forget it. Well, and 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 in that moment, it's like she she. She is not a player in the game, but she realizes that she has the ability to massively influence aspects of it from the sidelines. And she oh, and does. She's pissed. Yeah. Too. No, no, no. She's pissed. She wants Kavanaugh to get what's coming to him for that. Well, and, and it's not even like she loves or respects or believes Vic Mackey. It's like she knows that what Kavanaugh is doing is threatening her children and her family. And I she's think she loves do. Vic Mackey. I think that's part of it. She does not respect or believe him. But I think there is a little bit of love, and it's the same love for the children. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, but I also think she hates Kavanaugh. Uh, it's a combination with... of all that stuff. It's a stew, and that stew just boiled over in the middle, middle of the barn. Uh, yeah, no, it was great. It, it, it's, it's great. And so uh, uh, what, what do you figure? I would love to hear you spec speculate. What, what do you think we're setting the stage for in the next uh, season or, or two? Well, obviously, all this stuff that uh, he did with his Federale friend is going to come back to bite him in some way. Uh, he set a bunch of events in motion that are not good. Uh, word is going to get back to Guardo, uh, and, and something is going to come from that direction. I think we're not done with IAD sniffing around. We never have been. I mean, that's been the theme through the shield the entire time. So I'm curious what glove uh, that's going to make. Uh, we also ha have a, a prisoner uh, sitting there uh, in stir uh, planning things against Vic uh, that I don't think we've fully resolved that as well. And in the meantime, uh, fun to watch Wims and Wagenbach work together to try to rehabilitate the barn. She's going to be constantly challenged uh, from this point forward. And I think that's an interesting theme that's going to run out for I'll, a while. I'll, I'll tell you what, it, it, to me, and I think we're far enough along in this arc to um, to start talking about this, but it's like you've seen so far a number of hard-nosed um, political players in charge of the barn, and, and you just think like, wow, if we just had one honest person running things, one true believer, one person who does it by the book, then maybe they could clean this up. And then oh, you no. get whims yeah. who in every way does that. And that's the torture and the agony is you She's see gonna get eaten alive. You yeah. see all the ways in which being an honest, you, you see, she gets Jimmy Carterified, right? Genuinely yeah. good person, just not the right person for this job. Uh, or the right person for this job just at the wrong time. Yeah. You know, especially now. Or in the wrong circumstance for sure. Like, uh, although we do get to see Wagenbach uh, be the guy who really does know how to sniff out the guilty. Like, he is not fooled by Kavanaugh. Like, he knows what's going on. And it was nice to see Wims back in the interrogation room doing a little of her detective thing, oh, dude, which is what she's best at. That moment, man, when she calls out for the two officers to escort Kavanaugh out of there, that was amazing, dude. Strong. Yeah, strong it was great. Stuff. Well, that is it uh, for Spoiler in Time. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, you can find these and many other Spoiler in Time episodes at cordkillers.com, and we will see you next time we spoil you. I mean, you'll see us, but same difference. I was looking in their window. Is that illegal? Uh, roll credits. and
Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>